work on Polio. So, thank you. So, we, I just want to let people know we did invite Bobiel, but sadly he was not able to be here. And so we thought, you know, since it's a beautiful result, beautiful construction, and it fits perfectly with the theme, uh, one of us would report on it. So that's what I'm going to do. Of course, everything I say wrong is my own mistake, not his. And also, it's a very short paper, but and very beautiful. So I encourage everybody to take a look at it. Uh, maybe before I get started, let me just one more time remind people there will be a discussion session uh, today from 5.15 p.m. to 6.15 p.m., moderated by uh, Claire Voisson and Olivier Debar. Uh, and there will be a student who's taking notes on the questions, so hopefully we'll have those questions posted on the web page probably a few days after, a few, in a few days. Uh, also, there is a feedback form on the web page, so you might want to wait until the conference is over before giving us your final feedback, but please do give us your feedback. That helps us very much with our NSF reports. Okay, so I will talk about Boville's paper, a very general sextic double solid is not stably rational, and the approach is the approach that Claire Voisin first introduced. Boville uses the refinement by Coliotolin and Perutka. So, I mean, Alina just told us the formulation, but let me write it down one more time. So, the specialization theorem. Uh, so the base will be something one-dimensional. Say, for instance, a Henselian DVR, or if you prefer to think of it as an open subset of a smooth curve, uh, that would be fine too. Well, a non-empty open subset of a smooth curve. Uh, and you have some uh, projective flat family of varieties. Uh, there's a special point, spec of little k, and the fiber over that point, which is, in all of the examples, singular. <clears throat> but then the idea is that, given the singular variety, you somehow construct a deformation of that singular variety. And then you can look at the uh, generic point, or maybe the geometric generic point, uh, x here, and it's because this is singular, you have to impose some condition on the singularities. So you assume there exists some desingularization, some projective desingularization, uh, such that pi is universally, so let me write down the hypotheses, <coughs> pi is universally Chow zero trivial, which Alina just told us the definition. It means that whenever you make any extension of the field, the induced map of the induced push forward map on Chow zero is an isomorphism, but you can check that on points of y for every point of y, but not necessarily a geometric point, but for every point of y and for every field extension of the residue field, if you look at the fiber, you want that the fiber has uh, Chow zero trivial in the sense that the degree map is an isomorphism. <clears throat> and then over here, this might also be singular. So you take a desingularization. And maybe this one is also supposed to be universally Chow zero trivial. I'm not sure. Uh, in many examples, x will actually already be smooth. I mean, it's no? You don't have any hypothesis on this one? No. OK, good. So no hypothesis on that one. And then um, the sequence of uh, implications is that um, I guess if x is uh, retract rational, which in principle is a weaker condition than stably rational, then that implies that x is universally Chow zero trivial. And that in turn implies that this 
z is universally Chow zero trivial, which has a number of consequences. I mean, so one thing is that it implies that the unramified cohomology groups are, so it implies that the torsion, I mean, it has a number of consequences, and any one of these can be used as a way of disproving the sequence of implications. H3, if it happens to be defined over the complex numbers, and you look at the corresponding analytic space, uh, and you take its z coefficient cohomology, then the torsion in H3 will be zero. It also implies that all of the higher unramified cohomology groups with torsion coefficients are zero. And it also implies uh, the Brouwer group is zero. So if you can construct a diagram like this where for your z, you can prove that one of these fails, then it follows that z is not universally Chow zero trivial. And then for, um, I, maybe I can do this for the geometric generic fiber. Let me put a bar there. Then uh, it follows that for the geometric generic fiber of this family, um, that's also not universally Chow zero trivial and therefore not retract rational. So. <clears throat> Oh, yes, sorry. X tilde. Second one. Second one. Here. Yes. Universally Chow zero trivial. <clears throat> so that's the approach. But of course, then the question is how do you, I mean, there are two parts of this question. First of all, how do you find these y's and z's? And then the second part, how do you deform them? So as Alina explained to us, uh, after uh, Artin and Mumford constructed their example. And then there was study of these things as well by Bogomolov and Saltman from the point of view of understanding uh, uh, rationality, stable rationality of group quotients, which I think is related to the Noether problem. <coughs> uh, people uh, uh, did find a number of examples of Zs, but they tended to, the, the constructions tend to be rather elaborate. And it's not clear that they do deform to varieties which are somehow simpler than the variety z that one starts with. So Boville's article is giving an example where the construction of this y and z are very simple and geometric, but also it deforms in a simple way to other simple varieties. So finding examples of where all of this works, that's not so easy. So Boville's example. The previous x. No. Not this one? Like open, so. Well, yeah, it's a rash, it's a birational property, so it should. But I can, yeah, I could do either, I could do both of them. <laughs> x tilde <laughs> retract <laughs> rational. I mean, they're equivalent. So, so this is part of the statement. <laughs> what? This is the, st I mean, so this is a hypothesis, sorry. And then the statement is that you have the sequence of implications. The, you know, the crucial one is this one, that if you know this result about z, that, for instance, it's not, I mean, that it's not universally Chow zero trivial, then that property deforms. So that's the crucial implication. So again, I've stated it this way, but you tend to apply it in the contrapositive, that you somehow prove that z is, doesn't satisfy one of these properties, and therefore neither does, I mean, therefore, I'm sorry, it, the, what's quite interesting about this is that quite often x tilde does satisfy these properties, even though z doesn't. But by reformulating things in terms of this universal Chow zero trivial, which does uh, respect specialization, uh, you conclude that x tilde is not retract rational. So, <coughs> so Bill, Bobiel's construction. So he analyzes double covers of P3 branched over a sextic, uh, and he constructs examples where the z he, he has is um, not universally Chow zero trivial. So his y is going to be a double cover of P3 branched over a sextic. Let me try to get use the right notation here. Uh, I realize that the notation I wrote on my paper is inconsistent with this, so let me change the, the letter. 
So G, so you have some double cover. And it has some branch divisor. Of course, the branch divisor has even degree. <clears throat> and then the inverse image of the branch divisor, at least set theoretically, is just another copy of delta. So it sits inside of the double cover. This is the, the branch divisor, or maybe the ramification divisor, depending on what you call these things. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this will be degree 6 in the example. I want to make a disclaimer at the beginning, which is Beauville's disclaimer, which is that there, were, there was already work by uh, Ilyev and Katsarkov and I can't pronounce the last name, but I wrote it down. Uh, yes, that's right. Oh, where is it? Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, let me spell. So there, there was already an ana analysis of some such sextic double covers. But the example given here, I mean, Bobiel's example, is extremely geometric. So that's really what I, I want to explain. That you know, there are cases where you can construct these diagrams geometrically. What, how does one construct a double cover? I mean, well, in some sense, that's a silly question. You just take the defining equation for this branch divisor. You give yourself one more variable. You set the square of that variable equal to this defining equation. But to come up with an example where you can do the computations, you should give yourself a double cover where there's some meaning to uh, the points in the double cover, some geometric significance. In this case, the geometric significance has to do with parameter spaces of half-dimensional linear spaces in an even-dimensional quadric. So one specific one source of double covers comes from families of quadric hypersurfaces of even dimension, comes from uh, <coughs> quadric vibrations. Let me write Q uh, 2M vibrations. So if you have a quadric vibration over some base, in this case it's going to be P3, but it could be a more general base. <coughs> and again, the fiber, the general fiber is a quadric of even dimension. So let me assume that this sits inside of some uh, projective space bundle. E2M plus 1. I'm sorry, it sits inside of some projective space bundle, but I don't want to call it P2M plus 1. Uh, PE. Ah, and this one's going to be V tilde because it's going to be singular, sorry. So there will be a desingularization of this. Uh, so this is going to be a, a P2M plus 1 bundle. Vibration. Well, in this case, it will actually be a bundle. It will be the projectivization of a locally free sheaf. <coughs> But given such a thing, then first of all, in the base, I mean, I'm assuming the general fiber is a smooth quadric of even dimension. Smooth quadric of dimension 2m. But there will be a locus in the base where the fibers are singular. So we can stratify the base according to the rank of the quadric, the, gen the generic point of the base parameterizes a quadratic, I mean, the, the defining equation of this quadric is a quadratic polynomial of rank 2m plus 1. But we can look inside of the base at the locus where the rank is less than or equal to 2m. And then inside of that, we can look at the locus sigma, where the rank is less than or equal to 2m minus 1. And we could, in principle, proceed. But in this case, that's all we'll need. I mean, this will already be just a finite set of points. Uh, in the example, but given yes, uh, 
yes, I'm sorry. That's the 2m plus 1. You're right. Rank less than or equal to 2m plus 1. Rank less than or equal to 2m. Thank you. Yes. I was seeing that 2m. Sorry. Yes. Rank less than or equal to 2m plus 1. Rank less than or equal to 2m. So this is the locus where the fibers become singular. This is the locus where the fibers become even more singular. And uh, you can form the relative Hilbert scheme of this thing. I mean, just the parameter space for linear subspaces of half dimension. So, I mean, for the corresponding orthogonal group, the Dinkin diagram, because this quadric is even dimensional, it looks like this. And in particular, there are you know, two vertices at the end of the, the Dinkin diagram. The, Vertices of the Dinka diagram correspond to projective homogeneous spaces of Picard number one. And in particular, this one is going to correspond to the orthogonal Grassmannian parametrizing linear m-dimensional subvarieties of Q. And it will have two connected components. So those two different components, that's what's going to give you this double cover. So if you so given such a vibration, if you form the relative Hilbert scheme, uh, I guess m plus t choose m of v tilde, uh, v bar, v hat over p3, or whatever your base is, so this relative Hilbert scheme, and then look at the map down to uh, p3, this does not have geometrically connected fibers. You can form the Stein factorization of this thing. And that's where y is going to come from. So this will be the Stein factorization. This will be a two to one map. This will be G, a double cover. And let me give a name to uh, the involution on here. Let me call it sigma, this involution. And this will have, well, the geometric generic fiber of this will just be an orthogonal Grassmannian. So of this map will be an orthogonal Grassmannian. Ah, let me, okay, so affine dimensions, 2m plus 2, so half dimensional. <clears throat> uh, what about the singular fiber? So, I mean, this is something, uh, there must, somebody who knows more about these things than I do must be able to answer this question. But if you look inside of, um, well, I mean, inside of here I have delta, but I've also got delta inside of here. So if you look at a generic point of delta, what does the fiber of this look like? So in particular, is it still just an orthogonal Grassmannian? I mean, I don't see any reason why that should be true in general. But in the special case, that m equals 1. So in this case, what kind of quadrics are we talking about? We're talking about a quadric surface in P3, just isomorphic to P1 cross P1. And the parameter space of uh, uh, isotropic uh, lines, it's just two copies of P1. So in this case, this Hilb thing, the fiber of Hilb, it's just two copies of P1. And that's what's giving you the two different points in the fiber of G, these two different connected components. But when this thing specializes to a quadric cone, so you have these points in Y, which are specializing to a point in delta, it turns out that the fiber doesn't change at all. So when, if you look at Hilb, of course, it's no longer two copies of P1. If you, I mean, if you do it this way, it's non-reduced, but that's because this map is ramified at that point. When you analyze it, the fiber here is just still P1. So the fiber of Hilb over delta, the fiber is still just P1. So. Again, I don't know if that's something that holds for higher m or not. That's quite important in Bobiel's construction. So what that does it? Okay, all right. So this is some this is something general. Right, but they're speaking about the generic point of the ramification. Yes. So why do we only care about the generic point of the ramification? That's because. Um, there's a purity theorem. So in this case, again, when m equals 1, 
what we get is that if we look at this Hilbert scheme over y minus sigma, so we have y, this relative Hilbert scheme, which is just parameterizing linear subspaces of uh, <coughs> this family of quadrics, and then we have delta, and then inside of there we have sigma. If I take the open complement of sigma, then because of this... Jason, you, yes. you used y for the double covering. Yes, but I think that's, isn't that, did I, was I not supposed to do that? Is that okay? Uh, okay? I mean, so this is the double covering. This is the thing that has connected fibers. It's a P1 bundle. So again, in this case, M equals 1. If I restrict this Hilbert, the, o, the inverse image, uh, maybe I'll call this uh, O, uh, of the Hilbert's, of this open subset in the Hilbert scheme, this is a P1 vibration. It is not typically, and in this case, it's definitely not, the projectivization of a locally free sheaf of rank 2. It's an unramified conic bundle. It gives an element in the Brouwer group of <coughs> uh, y minus sigma. And then there's a purity theorem. So, well, unfortunately, y is usually singular at sigma. But there is a purity theorem that says for an element in the unramified for an open subset uh, w inside of a regular scheme. Let me call it y smooth. <coughs> if the codimension of the complement is bigger than or equal to 2, then the map from the Brouwer group of the whole thing to the Brouwer group of this open subset is an isomorphism. And here we have an element in the Brouwer group. I mean, we've got this P1 vibration. It, it gives us a two torsion element in the Brouwer group of uh, that set. So again, if you're, if you're thinking of how to extend this to other cases, uh, things will become more singular in higher co-dimension. But there is a purity theorem as well. So um, <clears throat> this purity theorem? The purity theorem is general. Uh, but of course, the fibers of this thing in general are orthogonal Grassmannians. Those are usually not projective spaces. So I mean, how do you go from one of those elements to an element in the Brouwer group? I mean, that needs some work. But you know, well, it's a homogeneous space. So presumably it comes from a torsor for the orthogonal group, and then there is a connecting map from H1 into H2 with some torsion coefficient. So presumably there is something that corresponds to the, this torsion element in the Brouwer group when M is larger. But Beauville works with M equals 1. Uh, and there are other good reasons for doing that. But I mean, this is something that you could try to apply more generally so in general, we can just take the even part of the Clifford algebra and it will easier. Ah, oh, OK. So yeah, I mean, in, yeah, it's always the, the uh, connecting map is mapping into H2 of the center of the universal cover. So I guess that's, that's always going to be uh, Z mod 2Z. I mean, the, the spin group is a double cover of the orthogonal group. So. Yeah, I guess always you're going to get some two torsion element in the Brouwer group. <clears throat> uh, all right. There is a, there's, but here's a question. Is this, so this is giving us some element in the Brouwer group. Maybe it's a zero element. So is this element non zero? So if it is non zero, then we can use this to. Uh, I mean, our z is going to be a desingularization of y, and you do have to worry about the singularities. But if, if this Brouwer element is non-zero, then we can use this to try to uh, prove that uh, z is not universally Chow zero trivial, and then apply the specialization theorem. So how can we think about whether this P1 vibration is trivial? Of course, that's equivalent to saying that there's a rational section, S. Now, if since this Hilbert scheme is parameterizing linear subvarieties of uh, the uh, 
fibers of that quadric vibration, if there was, if there exists a rational section S, then when you take some point in Y, and remember it comes together with a conjugate point sigma Y, then you can look at the linear, the m-dimensional linear space corresponding to S of Y, and then you can intersect it with uh, the m-dimensional linear space that corresponds to S of sigma of Y inside of this quadric of dimension 2m. And I mean, I don't know what dimension this is going to be, but it's at least dimension 0. So I mean, this will be some linear space. And the way we've constructed it, it's Galois invariant. So it's actually something that only depends on the image point in P3. So this is lambda of g of y. <clears throat> and now what we've done is we took our original, um, yes? You're losing me, you're losing me. What? <laughs> what one of those dimensions that you, you're going to take P, you're going to take M equals 1 in the end? Yep. So I'm going to take you know two lines inside of this quadric surface. I'm going to intersect them, and I'm going to get a point. So I mean, in that case, we certainly know what the dimension is. The dimension is zero. But you know, when when m is large, I mean, so yes, in the m equals zero case, we're already going to get the conclusion we want. But I just want to make this observation here that once once we have this thing, then sitting inside of here, I'm going to have some sub variety. Let me call it lambda, who's which is a, uh, a projective bundle over P3. It's not just that the fibers are projective spaces, but this is a linear subspace of this projective bundle. So it has an O of 1. So there's a rational section of this thing. Uh, yes? That could be empty for M higher than 1. I think I'm not. For M equal 2, typically it will be empty. Oh, is that right? But for, for M odd, it's OK. I'm sorry. So for M odd. But I mean, certainly for m equals 1. Two lines in a quadric, I mean, the two lines of opposite rulings in a quadric do intersect. So m odd, i.e., m equals 1. <laughs> then you get this uh, uh, intersection reduces your original vibration down to really a projective bundle, at least over a dense open subset. And projective bundles always have sections. So the conclusion is that if there exists a rational section of this vibration, then there exists a rational section of your original vibration. So this should be m odd, i.e. m equals 1. I mean, e.g. m equals 1. Then thus there exists a rational section of the original vibration. And now we're not thinking about Hilbert schemes or this double cover, which is somewhat indirect. We're thinking about a vibration we get to choose over P3. There exists a rational section t from p3 back to this v hat. <clears throat> OK, so now let me tell you the explicit. So again, if I can const if Beauville can construct one of these things that where this thing doesn't have a rational <clears throat> section, then this y minus sigma has non-trivial Brouwer group. And thus, we're going to be able to prove that the z is uh, not universally Chow trivial, and then we can apply the specialization theorem. So basically, the rest of the argument is, well, I mean, there are two parts of the rest of the argument, and I'm, I'm erasing something that's relevant. One is, what kinds of singularities does y have? I mean, we have to be able to construct this desingularization, which is universally Chow zero stable. So let me just address that first. There's, I mean, this, this question of, uh, uh, what kinds of discriminant loci do you get for families of quadric hypersurfaces? That's been studied a, a while ago. And in particular, Catanese proves that um, <clears throat> for a sufficiently general, well, OK, I'm sorry. The result of Catanese is for the specific construction. So let me come back to this. But uh, Catanese, he's going to tell us that for the specific construction. I still haven't told you what v over p3 we're going to use, but for the specific construction, uh, y has, I mean, exactly 31 ordinary double points precisely at the points of sigma. So the singular locus of y equals sigma. That's what you expect. And this 
is 31 ordinary double points of this threefold. So ordinary double points of a threefold, they are universally Chow zero trivial. OK, I'll tell you in a second, but delta is a degree 6 hypersurface in P3, as it must be. I mean, we're constructing a sextic double solid. So I'll tell you in just a moment, but let me just write down this so, so there exists this pi from z to y universally chow zero trivial. So what's the construction? So Boville starts with a cubic fivefold, so that contains a P2. So let P, which is going to be just a linear P2, sitting inside of V, uh, sitting inside of, uh, so this is going to be a cubic uh, fivefold, so sitting inside of P6, uh, be a cubic fivefold that contains a, a two plane. Is that right? Maybe you're right. Uh, I guess we could do the, the image. But let's just, let's just start with one of these things. It's actually not going to matter. I mean, you might say, well, maybe it's, somehow this is going to depend on uh, the Hodge structure or something like that. But actually, it won't. So he's going to work with cycles that are in dimension more than half the dimension. So I mean, you can just use the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem to analyze what's going on. So let this be a cubic hypersurface together with a two-plane contained in the, two, the cubic hypersurface. <clears throat> so if we look at the linear projection away from that two-plane, uh, that's going to map us to P3. So the P3 is going to be the parameter space for P3s that contain this P2 inside of, uh, so again, a, a point inside of here will be a pi, which corresponds to ah, a P3 that contains this P2. So maybe I should give a name to this other than P3, because I've got more than one P3 on the board now. Let's call it B. So B is just the parameter space. of linear P3s, let's call them pi, such that the given P2 is contained in pi. That means that if I take pi intersected with my uh, uh, cubic, and notice uh, pi cannot be contained in the cubic, again by the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem, <coughs> then this is p union some quadric. So that's going to give us the family of quadrics v hat. But of course, there's a more explicit model of this than, than what I've said, which is you can blow up that p2 inside of the cubic. And then the linear projection, well, if I blow up the p2 inside of uh, P6, then the linear projection becomes regular. So we can look at the blowing up of P in V. That sits inside of the blowing up of P in P6. And now I've got an honest regular morphism to the base. <clears throat> and this is going to be V hat. So now, again, this. What this shows is that if you take a point in the space, pi, then the fiber over that point, wait, I had a name for this map before. Was it G? I think it was G. So the fiber over this point, uh, q pi, I mean, it's just that thing. So th those are the fibers. <coughs> Why is this useful? It's useful because, well, I mean, before I finish and prove, so, uh, Really, the last step is to prove that there does not exist a rational section here. There does not exist some rational section T. I mean, maybe before I prove, explain what the general argument is, 
the simplest kind of rational section you could come up with would be a P3 that was contained in V. Then that would intersect every general P3 in a point in P6, and that would give a rational section. But the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem says the cohomology of V uh, up until the middle dimension is just the restriction of the cohomology from P6. In particular, these cycles, the, the, uh, this co-dimension 2 cycle, the P3 that we're looking for inside of this fivefold, it would have to be some integer multiple of the square of a hyperplane class, and that has degree divisible by 3. So it, you can't have a linear P3. And the argument that there can't be a rational section is a generalization of that. So if there exists, a rational section T, which is defined on some dense open subset, then you look at the cycle, which is the closure of the image. Consider the closure of the image. Let me just call it T of B, even though it's not everywhere defined. <clears throat> you look at the cycle class, and well, we could work with the Chow groups, but let's work with cohomology now. I mean, that's what uh, Boviel does h4 uh, of v hat with z coefficients. This would be a cohomology class, <coughs> well, automatically algebraic. I mean, but this is all algebraic, so that's not saying anything, such that the intersection with a general fiber of g is degree 1, uh, intersected with let me give a name to a general fiber. So if I take, well, I guess I've already given a name to it, q pi, so such that this thing intersected with q pi is equal to 1. So now we can just compute the cohomology of this thing. I mean, the cohomology of v, you know, again, the part of the cohomology we're interested in is just the restriction of the cohomology of p6. And then we're blowing up, so we know how the cohomology changes by the formal clef key formula for computing the Chow groups of a blowing up, or the cohomology of a blowing up. <clears throat> and so if you go through that, then the relevant cohomology group, h4 v hat z, well, of course, you have h4 v z. And then you're going to have a copy of h2 of the center of the blowing up, p z, and then a copy of h0 of the center of the blowing up. <clears throat> so it's rank 3. I mean, this is p, p, uh, p2. Uh, <clears throat> so it's rank 3. And you can write down what the generators are. Well, here, the generator is just the pullback of the square of a hyperplane class. So uh, this blowing up map, I didn't give it a name, did I? Uh, but Beauville calls it b, little b. <clears throat> so you have the upper star of the square of a hyperplane class. Um, here, it's uh, even easier. This class is the inverse image of a line in this uh, P3. So this is going to be g upper star of the class of a line. But of course, the intersection of that with the class of a point, g upper star of a point, is 0. So we need to look at the three generators and their intersection numbers. And then the final one is slightly more complicated. Uh, the final generator is a little bit more complicated. You want to pull back a P2 uh, from this base P3, but then you want to intersect it with something which is a relative hyperplane class inside of here. But the point that Beauville makes is that um, <coughs> we can, I mean, we just, we, a relative hyperplane class for this linear projection, we can just pull back, you know, a hyperplane from P6. So here it's going to be something like uh, B upper star H cap G upper star of um, a hyperplane class. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so when you compute this degree, you're computing the degree of uh, the hyperplane class, I mean, of Q with respect to the hyperplane class. So the intersection of this class with Q pi is 2. Again, the intersection of this class with q pi is 0. 
because you're taking a line in the P3 and a point in the P3, which don't have to intersect, and you're looking at their inverse images. And the last one you have to compute, but it turns out to be 2 again. So in particular, they're all even. Um, let me see. So yeah, it does seem like it should be 0. Maybe I got that wrong. Let me look at his definition. In any case, it's even. It's even. It's even, but. Well, OK. Yeah. So this is, let me just say even. Uh, but you're right. So I think I, I think I said this one wrong. You do need a hyperplane class on the fibers. And that does seem to be the inverse image of a hyperplane class from P6. But since you pull back a class of hyperplane from B, already it intersects by 0. That's, yeah, that's right. So, uh, well, it's even anyway. The last one is even. So if you take any integer multiple, any integer linear combination of these things and intersect it with Q pi, it's even. It's not 1. So there does not exist. So there doesn't even exist a cohomology class that has this property. An integer cohomology class. So again, you know, I think one of the themes here is that it's really not enough to work with rational coefficients. You have to work with integer coefficients. There does not exist an integer cohomology class whose intersection uh, alpha such that alpha intersect Q pi is odd, in particular 1. <clears throat> OK, so that means that this v hat over, is it gone? The v hat over uh, uh, the double cover, I'm sorry, the Hilbert scheme over the double cover uh, So this one, there does not exist a rational section of this. Now, you do have to worry. I mean, first of all, there's this result of Catanese. When you take this particular family of uh, quadric surfaces, uh, you can work out, ex I mean, there, you can work out explicitly what it is in terms of a defining equation for V. If you write down uh, coordinates on P6, so that the two plane is the set of points of the form x0, x1, x2, 0, 0, 0, 0, I think. 3, 4, 5, 6. Yep, that's it. Then uh, you can write out the equation of uh, a, de a defining equation of V3 expanded with respect to these coordinates. So f will be, um, well, it has to vanish when you plug in that all of these additional coordinates are 0. So uh, it can't have any part that's sort of constant in these. So it has, it has a linear part in the first uh, three variables. Let me call the last variables y. So it has a part that's linear in the x's and quadratic in the y's, and then a part that's quadratic in the x's and linear in the y's, and then a part that's uh, cubic in the y's. And uh, Okay, I'm almost done, so I guess I can use this board. Uh, if you expand this out a little bit more, then that's going to be a sum uh, 0 less than i less than or equal to j less than or equal to 2 xi xj uh, aij of the y's plus sum 0 less than or equal to i less than or equal to 2 uh, xi bi of the y's plus c of the y's. And when you look at the uh, discriminant of this family of quadrics, it's uh, the determinant of the 4x4 uh, uh, four four matrix uh, that has a 3x3 three three block coming from the aij's, and then a block coming from the bi's, and then the c. So I mean, again, this is a 3x3 three three block of linear polynomials this is a cubic polynomial, so when you add up the degrees, this has degree 6. So the zero locus of this uh, discriminant, I mean this delta is a sextic.
And if you look at what the rank um, <coughs> two locus is, then it's just 31 uh, uh, isolated points. I mean, again, if the A, I, J's, B, I, and C are sufficiently general, then it's 31 ordinary double points. And the double cover Y, I'm sorry, it's just 31 points, and the double cover has ordinary double points at each of those 31 points. Therefore, there does, if you just take the usual desingularization, it is universally Chow zero trivial, which is almost the last thing you need. There is a little bit of an issue, which is that technically we have only constructed this Brouwer class on y minus sigma. And now there's this purity theorem, but y isn't regular. So you have to think about when you pass to a desingularization z and you pull back this unramified Brouwer class, does it extend? And it does. Bovia works, he translates everything into uh, integer cohomology. So he assumes that he's working over the complex numbers and he thinks about it in those terms. But I'm pretty sure that um, the, uh, the, re the sort of residue theorem for uh, Brouwer groups will also give the same result. I mean, in cohomology, the point is that um, the, the residue map from um, H3, uh, uh, the smooth part of uh, Y, uh, Z, and really we're only interested in the torsion coefficients. It maps to the torsion in, um, I think it's H2 of the exceptional locus. Is that right? Uh, the Giesen map here. Yeah, that's right. H2 of the exceptional locus. Z. But torsion. And of course, we can work out what this is, and it doesn't have any torsion. But I think there's, a, there, I mean, there is a similar residue map for Brouwer groups. I'm sorry, this is, this is the co kernel of the restriction map from this desingularization. So if you have this class here, and you want to know whether it's the restriction to this open subset of a class which is you know, global, everywhere unramified Brouwer class, you have to ask whether its image here is zero, but this group is zero. But there's a similar thing for Brouwer groups. It maps to h1 of the divisor with coefficients in q mod z. So I'm, I mean, I assume that this group is also zero. I mean, it must match up with with this group, and that's the thing that measures whether or not your Brouwer class extends. So, extend the P1 vibration. I mean, it's already extended from this construction of the Hilbert scheme. I mean, there's an issue of can you extend it in such a way that it's everywhere smooth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, okay. You're saying you know how to do that, or that's what this is proving? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let me stop there. Questions? Um, yes, on quartic double three folds and double four folds. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I reported on this paper. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know what he does in the other paper, but I mean, it, I, my, I did look at it briefly, and I think it is also quite explicit. I have a, a concrete example, which is not extremely uh, rational. Or just a concrete uh, example. <laughs> what explicit? Something of a, of a smooth sixty uh, double solid, which is not extremely rational. It doesn't give give that, does it? I don't, I mean, again, Alina uh, explained that, well, you know, you can pass the positive characteristic, and now if you look at some mixed characteristic DVR, I mean, so DVR, once you know this thing in positive characteristic is uh, not stably rational, then you also know for the generic fiber that it's, I mean, the geometric generic fiber that it's not stably rational, which means there's some finite extension 
I mean, it can't be stably rational over that number field either, but even if you think about the geometric version of that problem, then it's not stably rational. So, I mean, I think in that sense, you can write down explicit examples over, I mean, one could write down explicit examples over number fields. Work out what the finite field explicit example is, and then just lift. But I don't know what, what the equation would be. Over C? Um, well, if you construct an example over a number field, then you construct an example over C. But, I mean, yes. What's the rational over C? Uh, no, no, yeah, it's, if something is stably rational for Q bar, it's a good enough to be stably rational over C. Well, certainly the things that are actually being proved are these universal Chow zero trivial. And that's something that's stable under base change by fields, by definition. So you are constructing examples over C which are not stably rational. I don't know how easy it would be, and again, Alina would be a better person to ask, how easy it would be to write down the defining equations with coefficients in some explicit number field. But. Right, I guess you will, you will maybe discuss some very specific things. Right, I'll say all the same things again. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions?